uma universidade conectada com o seu tempo, com a ciência e com a formação humana. A Universidade de Caxias do Sul é uma universidade comunitária que tem como missão produzir, sistematizar e socializar o conhecimento com qualidade e relevância para o desenvolvimento sustentável. Conectada com você, sua vida e seus sonhos. Cerca de 100 mil pessoas levam no seu currículo o nome da Universidade de Caxias do Sul. Mas o legado de uma universidade não pode ser só medido pelo número de pessoas que ela formou, mas também pelos conceitos e ideias que ela ajudou a revolucionar, pelas empresas que ajudou a implantar e até mesmo pelos sonhos que ela ajudou a concretizar. A marca da Ux ultrapassou as barreiras do tempo e os limites do espaço. Ela está impressa em milhares de histórias e conquistas e segue sua trajetória de sucesso, preparando pessoas com capacidade para transformar o mundo, criar o novo e antecipar o futuro. Universidade de Caxias do Sul. Muito bom dia a todos. Good morning. Bom giorno a tutti. Em nome de nosso reitor, professor Gelson Leonardo Reck, gostaria de saudar a todos os que nos acompanham e saudar especialmente o professor Alex Eckert, coordenador do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Administração, saudar também presente o professor Panisson e, particularmente, saudar os professores Matteo Cristófaro, professora Luna Leone, da Universidade de Tor Vergata. Sejam bem-vindos todos a esta aula magna, Masterclass do PPGA. Uma saudação também a todos os nossos estudantes de mestrado, de doutorado, 
estudantes eventualmente de graduação, comunidade em geral, que nos acompanhe. Queria desejar a todos um ano uh, muito profícuo de estudos, de investigação, um ano de muitas conquistas nesta nossa Universidade de Caxias do Sul, uma universidade comunitária, da comunidade, que investe todos os seus recursos no desenvolvimento das pessoas e da região. Sem mais delongas, resta-me desejar a todos um excelente encontro. Muito obrigado. Muito bem, bom dia a todos. Um cumprimento especial aos nossos professores e alunos do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Administração da Ux, mestrado e doutorado, aos demais participantes que estão prestigiando esse evento, em especial aos palestrantes do evento, os professores Luna Leone e Mateu Cristófaro. Professores Luna e Mateu, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to participate of this event, transmitting some of your knowledge to us. Embora nossas aulas já tenham iniciado, a palestra de hoje marca o início oficial das atividades do semestre, do mestrado e doutorado em administração da Ux. O tema que estaremos tratando aqui nesta manhã é diretamente relacionado com o nosso dia a dia de pesquisador, que é a questão da publicação de nossas pesquisas, bem como as interferências da inteligência artificial, cujas novidades são quase que diárias. Transmito também um desejo de um bom evento, enviado pelo professor Marcelo Boquese, diretor da área de sociais da Universidade de Caxias do Sul. Desejo um excelente evento a todos e passo a palavra agora ao professor Matheus Panisson, que fará a apresentação dos nossos palestrantes. Uh, muito obrigado, professor Alex. Thank you very much, professor Alex. And thank you so much in advance, uh, Luna and Mateo, for accepting the invitation for this digital masterclass. We are very happy for having uh, this uh, international discussion overseas. And please feel yourself at home. We are in a region that's of Brazil that shares strong bonds with Italy. Uh, first, I'd like to also thank everyone who are here and those who will be watching this recording in the future and has, well, all the team involved in the organization of this event. And to introduce, I'd like to contextualize the why of this event. So uh, I'd like to situate that one of the main reasons we are all here is due to the commitment of PPJ with student success, internationalization and impact. And therefore, as Professor Lelex says, in the research journey, and by that I mean to the PhD or master studies, the communication of the research outputs for the scientific community, it's an important stage. So this master class that will be provided by Luna and Matteo, in, in essence, it is about communication and how can we improve our communication for the world. Uh, maybe we can have very good ideas, original discoveries, but we need to learn how to tell the story with the proper language. And this is a matter of learning best practices, but also to really practice and gain experience day by day. And at the same level, we are living a very special time of human history where new AI technologies will now reshape our relationship with all the research workflow and where especially the writing and publication process like augmenting capabilities, automating tasks and even innovating the way we communicate. So this both topics, and this is why the Publishing Social Science Research Masterclass is about best practice and AI tools. I just like to quickly mention, this is very quickly, that this event is also symbolic because now in 2023, we are completing 10 years of the Brazilian Journal of Management and Innovation. That is part of PPJ history. It was founded by the vision of Professor Maria Emilia Camargo as the first editor in a time where even innovation wasn't a mainstream topic in Brazil as we are living now. And among the years, the June grew uh, by the work of the editorial teams with editors such as Professor Fabiano Lorenz, Professor Alex Eckert, 
uh, who believed in the mission and the importance of the diffusion of scientific knowledge and the development for the society and organization serving the academic community. So a big thank you very much for all of you and the opportunity to discuss this theme, which is transversal to all the research lines. So therefore, without further ado, we are very grateful to introduce Professor Luna Leone, who is the Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Information and Operations Management Education, and Professor Matteo Cristofaro, who is the Editor-in-Chief of International Journal of Business Research Management. You can check out more about the extensive curriculum expertise of professors in the YouTube channel. And Professor Luna and Professor Matteo, who are also from the Tor Vergata University of Rome, will conduct now the presentation. After that, will be a question and answers available for the audience. Uh, me and Marielle will be capturing the, the presentation and mediating the discussion. So thank you so much, Luna and Matteo, for sharing your knowledge and wish you a great masterclass. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you, Mateus, and thank you also to um, for this invitation. We uh, it is a pleasure for us and a great honor to be here today and to have the possibility to share what we have like uh, reached during our studies, during our PhD, postdoc uh, program, and, and so on, in order to give uh, this knowledge to uh, to your students. Obviously, uh, we do not have so much time in order to provide all the information, all the knowledge that is needed in order to properly address uh, publications, uh, even in terms of styles, uh, research needed, and so on. But um, both me and uh, Matteo, we are available even after this, uh, this class in order to provide if you need any additional material, if you need um, any other uh, information related to, to this topic. So basically, our, um, our presentation is, um, is basically structured in uh, five main points. So we will briefly, very briefly introduce ourselves, and then we will go through the scientific writing tips uh, with Matteo, uh, AI tools in academic research um, by me, and how to get away with reviewers, still by uh, both, both me, of us, yeah, <laughs> both of us. And then we had also um, thinking about the possibility to provide some opportunities in terms of publication that are in some way strictly related to both Matteo and, uh, and I. So um, concerning our uh, curricula, actually, um, you can see us uh, sharing also the same screen. Mm -hmm just because we have shared a lot, not only in uh, professional terms, but also in personal terms. So uh, we have together uh, a son, uh, as you can see mm -hmm. in the picture uh, on the slide, but we shared actually a lot of um, the professional journey, we could say. Uh, we have studied both uh, in the Torvegata University in Rome, and there uh, we hold our PhD and um, even uh, some master courses and uh, the postdoc um, activities. Uh, right now, I'm an associate professor in, uh, in management, uh, whilst mm. Matteo is uh, an assistant professor uh, in management. And um, as you can see, we are uh, not only uh, editor-in-chief, but uh, we are also a program manager of different master courses in our university. We have different type of courses and um, starting from last year, if mm -hmm. I'm not wrong, uh, Matteo actually is part of the uh, Academy of Management for the um, history division yeah. and also for the um, international federation of uh, scholarly association of management that is actually the association that involves uh, the most important scholars on management um at the not only european level oh, but worldwide level. Yeah. World, world level so 
Thank that. Uh, I will leave the floor to Matteo for the first part of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for uh, for this invitation. We appreciate it a lot. Thank you, uh, really. And uh, I'll start the presentation uh, with the uh, tips, scientific writing tips from research idea generation to, to reporting. So the first point when uh, entering the uh, PhD journey or when starting writing social research is uh, first of all having an idea. Usually that idea is connected most of the times with the topic, the subject that has been uh, um, that has been at the center of passion within the uh, the master course or the bachelor course that a person has uh, pushed, uh, and it is the subject, the topic that then will cover also the PhD journey. So it is something that is usually inspired by the teacher, the professor that instructed this course. Uh, and that uh, will find some uh, some fits with the uh, with the person that uh, wants to push this uh, this social science research activities. So the question is okay, but after having raised that passion in the in the student in the master student or the PhD student, uh, how to find an idea that is a publishable idea, something that is valuable for the uh, for uh, for the research community and for the practice community, because a master thesis is different from a PhD thesis, and the publication is different from both, from a master thesis and PhD thesis. So there should be a strong research question and strong research aim that is at the center of this uh, uh, social science research program. So here there are, uh, I'm going to show some of the main sources for the idea generation in, uh, of research questions for uh, social science research, specifically imagine that is the field in which Lun and I work and uh, have our, uh, our interest. First of all, the first thing uh, I suggest when approaching uh, a field uh, as to identify the uh, the, the, the research question that is important for us and for the world is to look at published reviews. So um, even if you think that you are the first in a field, the first to think about a research question in a, in a topics, so the first thing to, 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 to do is looking for reviews uh, scientific reviews that have been published on this team, because usually uh, on that uh, on that field on that team there are already reviews that have been published since uh, science has uh, progressing as a, a very fast pace, uh, and since there are a, a lot of journals worldwide that are filling the the the, the research science uh, environment. So for sure there will be a review that is connected with your field, your topic, and from that review you can identify what are the main uh, topics that have been uh, treated during the last uh, 5, 10, 20 years, or there are also uh, the gaps in the literature that have been spotted and that can be fruitful for uh, investigating the, the field uh, uh, in the future. So the first thing, looking at, uh, at reviews, because also they give uh, methodological, uh, uh, let's say, directions to the, to the social sense research social science research, research that you want to, to push because of the fact that some methodologies in that field have been already adopted, some ones failed, some others instead uh, were successful. Uh, so, uh, or maybe there was also a, recon a reconceptualization of the, of, the, uh, of the idea that you have in mind. So first of all, looking at reviews because they give the direction for future works in that field that has, uh, has, has been spotted as the one in which the research question insists. So then uh, another source of uh, good research questions for uh, theory, but uh, even more for practice, are magazines. Despite the fact that they are not strictly related uh, to uh, science and uh, research, magazines, newspapers, 
are uh, a good source for research questions. I provide just you an example. There is a famous theory in uh, management uh, and organizational research. It is the upper echelons theory by uh, Donald Embrick and Mason in 1984 that has been published on the Academy of Management Review. From that theory, in brief, says that the sociodemographic characteristics of uh, top managers in a company will affect the uh, performance of companies, such as having a board of directors composed of young people uh, will increase the chances of uh, having uh, decisions oriented to uh, research and development efforts. So more investments in research and development because of the fact that it's composed, the, the board is composed of young people. So the uh, how Embrick and Mason, and this theory now is one of the most spread in uh, management organizational research, and it has its own field, for example, in the Academy of Management, uh, in, in the Academy of Management, because while submitting a paper in the Academy of Management for the conference, for the annual conference, there is uh, a specific reference to the uh, to contributions that uh, will inform operations theory, just to give an hint of how much this theory is important. Um, and Embrick and Mason declared themselves that this idea of investigating the social demographic characteristics of managers connected to the organizational performance came up while reading uh, Financial Times, if you remember well, the name of the, of the, uh, of the magazine the newspaper and they have seen in that uh, in that magazine that uh, there was a long list of the uh, most important companies in US at that time uh, in the 80s and uh, for each company it was depicted the uh, the board and the social demographic characteristics of the board so they questioned themselves why financial times is uh, providing us with info about the social demographic characteristics of the uh, top managers. Why are they important in order to understand how companies behave? So magazines can be uh, a good source for research questions, also in, uh, in social science research. And uh, the questions that can arise from, uh, from the reading of uh, magazines and newspapers have the pro that are for sure uh, questions that are important for the practice. So you will uh, uh, attack a research question that for sure is important for the world that is outside. That then, of course, you need to find a link also to what has been said in terms of, uh, of research by looking, for example, at reviews, as said before. Last but not least, looking at major scholars in that field in order to find the direction that the field is uh, uh, now uh, now pushing. For example, if you want to know uh, what is uh, on the verge of uh, strategy science, you can look at uh, Michael Port, that is one of the most famous uh, professor and researcher in, uh, in the strategy science. So looking at what is publishing and looking at the directions of his own articles can give you an hint of, uh, wha of where the, 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 the research about strategy is going from now to onward. So looking at what major scholars are investigating are looking can be a source for uh, new research questions departing from very strong and solid studies. Then it can happen sometimes that while you have started this process of having found a research question that is important for you, uh, that is important also for theory and practice, thanks to these uh, free uh, sources, it can happen that sometimes uh, there is a, a, another work that is published in the meanwhile uh, you are uh, doing your research and it is closer, it's very close to what you are investigating. Or there is sometimes the case in which you want to tackle a research question that is uh, that has been already addressed by other scores, but you think it can give different results if investigated in other contexts. So what I'm saying is that uh, looking for uh, industry connections and the geography connection to research questions can help the social science researcher 
to escape a, a problem in which there is a, a paper, another publication that is uh, that has already attacked the research question that you have found important, and looking at the uh, at the boundaries of a theory within uh, an industry that has not been investigated or geography that has not been investigated can provide the novelty needed for uh, uh, pushing uh, again and again that research question forward. Uh, otherwise, you have maybe to uh, put in the trash all uh, the, the research activities that you have already done for, uh, for, that, for that work, for that paper connected with the, the found research question. So, after having found the, uh, the research question that is important for theory practice that hopefully has not been already uh, attacked by other scholars, so it is, uh, you have the diamond in your hands and you can uh, start craft crafting that diamond. Uh, the second thing to do is to identify the methodology that you have to use for um, that you have to use for crafting that diamond and for answering the research question. This is a very important step because sometimes uh, usually um, it happens that uh, the, the scholar with the, the good research question starts uh, investigating uh, the research question, answering the research question with the sources, the materials that are available to him, her, uh, without looking at the uh, stage of maturity of the field and without looking at what could be the best method for uh, attacking that, uh, that research question. Uh, so in that case, there is a, a very good work by Edmondson McManus in 2007, published in, uh, in Academy of Manager interview that explains us how to identify the, the perfect, the fitting uh, methodology for our research question for our paper according to the stage of the stage of maturity of the field in which this uh, research question lays. Uh, indeed, this paper is called the methodological fit in management field uh, research. Uh, this <clears throat> can be uh, apparently connected just with uh, management research, but it is not in the sense that this way of uh, mm, intersecting uh, research questions uh, with the topics and the methodology is valid also for other social science fields, not just for uh, management. It's kind of universal uh, reasoning consideration that we can, uh, we can make. Starting from uh, the 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 the, uh, the down part of uh, of this matrix, we can see that uh, there is a theory on the x-axis. So uh, theory at the nascent intermediate major uh, level uh, can uh, feature the, the 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 field, and then there is on the y-axis the methodology qualitative. Uh, hybrid or uh, quantitative. So uh, while intersecting those two axes, we can identify different uh, types of methodology, conceptual, empirical, quanti qualitative, empirical, quantitative, and review. So if the research question you have in your hands, the diamonds you have in your hands is something uh, whose variables have not been uh, ever investigated by the scholar. So it's a very new phenomenon. Uh, so uh, we can uh, identify uh, it as uh, an ascent, uh, as insisting, as lying in an ascent uh, stage of, uh, of theory. And the best way to attack this research question is by a conceptual work because of the fact that uh, no one has already investigated those variables. So this field is uh, very new. For example, uh, a field that is uh, um, that is uh, uh, at the conceptual level can be, for example, uh, the use of uh, blockchain technologies or uh, or for management studies can be the use of the, the investigation regarding cryptocurrencies that can be uh, investigated in uh, some marketing uh, uh, subtopics. Uh, and there are other new topics that still wait a uh, conceptualization. Another, another uh, topic that waits conceptualization is uh, the metaverse. In that case, indeed, there are 
are very, very few studies published on the metaverse and they are at the conceptual level. So uh, in that case, before uh, investigating uh, with uh, qualitative or uh, quantitative data uh, the effect, for example, of the metaverse on the consumption behavior of users, uh, there should be uh, an initial framework, initial conceptual framework that can explain the variables that affect the consumer behavior for metaverse. So uh, conceptual frameworks are uh, appreciated and are the fitting ones at the, at the beginning. Then uh, while the fields progress from uh, uh, the nascent theory, the, the nascent stage of the theory to the major stage of theory, so uh, uh, more empirical qualitative articles start appearing, trying to uh, collect first and uh, data thanks to interviews and uh, open questions in service and to identify if the variables that are present in the conceptual frameworks uh, the nascent theory are valid uh, if there are uh, uh, boundaries for uh, for uh, for those variables and if that if those variables uh, found uh, a relationship with the practice so finding if those variables exist in, uh, in 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 the practice in the real world then uh, after having identified if those variables continue uh, continue existing also in the real world empirical quantitative articles are the ones uh, that best fit the the, the, the research question and uh, and the field uh, because of the fact that more and more data at qualitative level have been collected and those should be tested if the relationship found at the qualitative level are verified also in quantitative terms. So if there are significant differences, significant results that are valid at the quantitative level. So in that case, you test if the theory uh, really works according to a large amount of data that you collect, can, can collect uh, from uh, consumers, for example, users and other type of samples, managers and so on. Uh, and test if they are uh, if they uh, respect the, the theory uh, if the theory works in practice according to a quantitative point of view last but not least after uh, a, a theory has passed the NAS and intermediate major stage a lot of uh, works has been published over the years. It thinks that this process from nascent to major can take 15, 20 years, more or less, usually, usually. Uh, then there is a moment in which some scholars uh, ask themselves, okay, uh, the conceptual framework that we had at the beginning is still valid after 10, 15 years, 20 years of investigation. So in order to answer this question, uh, review bibliometric analysis uh, and uh, um, other kind of uh, literature research are conducted in order to verify if the initial framework is still valid, if this framework should be uh, readapted, reshaped, and what is the way forward for the uh, for the future. Indeed, you 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 can imagine that um, these 10, 15 years, 20 years of research that pass from uh, the nascent to the major stage uh, have not been directed by other studies except the original ones, the original conceptual frameworks that have been published at the beginning. So they, uh, the, 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 the theory uh, grown according to different streams and it needs an integration. And this integration that occurs with the review then should, uh, should, the, the, should indicate the way forward for the future. So uh, <coughs> it, it identify if the variables that uh, were at the beginning of the of the nascent at the nascent theory stage were are still valid and uh, if there are methodological gaps to uh, to, to to push you or if there are new uh, substreams of research within that uh, within, within that field that should be uh, accounted for and that should be investigated more and more. For example, I'm in the stage of uh, writing a, a review of the behavioral strategy field uh, with some uh, eminent scholars uh, that are the same that uh, conceptualize the behavioral strategy at the beginning of, uh, 
of, of this field in 2011, more or less officially. Uh, you can look at that paper, Bera Strategy, published in a strategic management journal. So after uh, 10 years, more or less, uh, there, have, um, there have been a lot of uh, qualitative and quantitative studies within the field of behavioral strategy, but no one that reviewed that field. So we are doing that in order to inform future scholars that are interested in uh, behavioral strategy research that you can connect, for example, with the behavioral economics, the behavioral finance in terms of uh, reasoning of what is behavioral strategy research, merging uh, behavioral assumptions with uh, strategic assumptions. Then, you know that after uh, having uh, identified uh, the research question that is important for you, the literature and the practice, uh, and identified the methodology, you have implemented those, uh, this methodology and uh, collect and analyze data if there is a, an empirical quantitative or quantitative paper or also a review article in which they, for which data we mean articles that have been reviewed for building the, the review article. Uh, so at a certain point after having finished the, uh, the, the, the collection and analysis of data, you have the phase of uh, reporting. So starting writing the, the paper, uh, I start from the very beginning of uh, a paper that is the abstract. For sure, the abstract is usually is usually the last part of the paper that is written. So it is the last thing that uh, authors write. But I start from the beginning because uh, while investigating the abstract, we are able to identify the traditional structure that papers have, that scientific works have. So I start from the beginning because, from the abstract, because it gives light to what is a paper in a synthesized manner. Uh, so, mm, uh, you know, the section of the paper is composed of abstract, uh, then the introduction, literature, background, uh, methodology, findings, discussion and uh, conclusions. And we are going in the next minutes to face each them to identify how uh, they are structured uh, and uh, how they differ according to the types of paper that we have seen in the metrics before, conceptual, empirical, qualitative, quantitative articles and review articles. So how those uh, all, all the communication styles of this paper differ according to the uh, different types of paper that you are uh, that you are building. So the abstract usually, as I said before, is the final part of the paper. Uh, it lasts between 150 and uh, 250 words. Uh, and the main points that an abstract should take up uh, for informing the reader uh, are the following ones. States of the art, problematization of the, of the literature, methods, results, and the implications. I want to stress that those five points are equal for each kind of paper, even if it is conceptual, review, and empirical. And I would also say that this kind of structure is, uh, let's say, uh, always the same also for other social science uh, research fields. It's a kind of uh, a traditional structure that is applied by scholars in, uh, in different fields uh, within the, the social science research and also outside the social science research uh, domain. So uh, starting from the abstract, you can, if you can see at uh, uh, this short abstract that I've pasted, uh, this comes from an article published by, by me in 2019 that is um, a review article on the role of uh, emotions in management decisions. It was published in 2019 on European Management Journal. And uh, while looking at the sentences of this abstract, you can identify the five bullet points that are above. For example, about the uh, state of the art, you can uh, start reading the abstract and say and uh, and uh, seeing. Since the birth of the boundary rationality concept, scores have been increasingly involved in identifying how managing decisions are made. 
Identifying the role played by affect has been a crucial part of the mission. So this is the state of the art. What scores have been investigated in uh, the last years about the role, about bandit rationality and the role uh, of emotions in the rationality of managers. And then there is the problem problematization. What is missing in the literature? That is the most important uh, part of the intro in order to attract the interest of the reader. So saying what is missing in the, in the literature and why your paper is important. However, despite the recent type in the number of research published on this theme, a systematization of those contributions able to identify the different functions played by different affected states is still lacking. So uh, a, re a review, a systematization of results on, uh, on the role of affect in measuring decision was lacking, and this uh, was leaving the field uh, not integrated and with the scholars also producing uh, duplicates in their research. Though, so uh, this paper was important that time in order to integrate those different streams and then uh, identify the way forward. Uh, then we have the methods. So uh, it is uh, said how I conducted this uh, this review. Uh, the implementing methodology is systematic literature review. I provide more info. Then there is uh, a results sentence. Results on the of the thematic analysis show these six distinct, distinct functions played by affect and etc. Uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And finally, there is the implication. So the value of this work lies in offering a model of the functions played by affect imagined decisions and so on. So uh, this structure of, of the abstract is the, let's say, the functional one in order to uh, provide the, uh, all the information uh, to the reader about the, the paper in terms of what you are investigating, what is the problem you are addressing, the methods you have adopted, results, that you reach the implications you want to, to provide at their attention. Uh, and this is the first hook for readers. Indeed, when you uh, and the audience in general look for uh, papers published uh, on a topic, the first <coughs> thing they, they, they look after the title is the abstract. If the abstract the, the, does not attract the, the reader attention, uh, you can be sure that the reader will skip that paper at 99%. So the, will, the paper will be, will be not read, will not be read, uh, will not be cited, they will not have its impact in, uh, for theory and, and, and practice. So this uh, structure that I have just identified is the same structure that you can find in the introduction. Uh, the introduction has the same structure that I said for the abstract. We can consider the, uh, the introduction as uh, uh, an explosion of the, of the abstract concept. So each, um, each sentence in the abstract about the state of the art, problematization, uh, methods, results, and implication has an own paragraph within the introduction. So there should be five paragraphs within the introduction, each one depicting the state of the art, uh, problematization, uh, methods, results, and implication. So in the in um, uh, looking at the uh, at the problem uh, uh, from uh, from the bottom to, to the top, we can say that the introduction that the, the abstract is a synthesis of the introduction. What is important to uh, identify, apart from uh, the explosion of the uh, of the of, of the abstract in interactional terms, is to say that within the uh, the introduction uh, you have to enter not only the conversation of the field of the field uh, that you are pointing uh, us to to provide. Uh, useful answers for for the reader but you have also to enter the conversation of the journal you want to point uh, for uh, publishing your uh, your research uh, so um, in that case if you want for example to uh, send this manuscript uh, that you are working on for a academy of manager journal or academy of manager review or another big uh, journal uh, in your field in your field you have to identify 
what have been the uh, the, the 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 publications that have been already the, uh, published in that journal what are the connections of your publications with that uh, with that ones and to see if uh, also editors and associate editors of that journal have been uh, uh, part of that conversation this is because of the fact that uh, you are not just participating uh, in a dance uh, between you and uh, and the field we are participating in dance with you the field and the journal that is publishing your research so the journal is interested in uh, advancing your research but at the same time advancing the conversation of that field in which your search lies in uh, in their pages so it is important to find this uh, this connection and it is a win-win uh, process because also uh, other scholars that are uh, um, interested in uh, advancing your research or answering the future research that you will point out at the end of the paper maybe you want to do that in the pages of the same journal you have uh, in which you have published your research uh, so it is uh, it is important to also shape the conversation according to, to to the journal in that case the length of the interaction should be between 600 words 900 words no less because otherwise you are not providing useful information in extensive manner no more because then you are uh, taking words that are important for uh, other sections of the paper and maybe you are uh, you then start boring the the reader uh, while approaching your your paper Indeed, uh, the reader, after having read the title of the paper and the abstract, then is interested in reading your introduction. So the introduction is the uh, second or third business card of your work. And uh, uh, while uh, uh, reading it, the, the, uh, the, the reader should be convinced again that it is worth for him her spending uh, his time to, to read your work. So this is the other business card that should be very, very well crafted in order to, uh, to, to, to attract the reader and uh, continue uh, and let him uh, continue reading, reading your work. This is an example of the, of the introduction. As you can uh, see, it comes from the same article I showed you before the, uh, the abstract. And uh, you can see that the first paragraph of, uh, of this introduction is about, for example, the boundary rationality and the role of emotions in the uh, boundary rationality and connect with the management decisions. Uh, indeed, the, the, the paragraph starts with Herbert Simon, that is father, the father of boundary rationality. Uh, and it is depicted the main uh, assumption of the theory in which uh, Herbert Simon states that individuals cannot ever, ever reach optimal decisions because of their innate cognitive and biological limitations. And then are provided other very uh, important assumptions connect connected with the boundary rationality, the role of emotions in boundary rationality, and what has been done uh, by other scholars investigating uh, this connection, boundary rationality and the emotions in uh, managerial decision making. <coughs> then pro problematization, again, the however. The however is the usual word that you can see in the second paragraph of the intro, and that uh, underlines how, uh, how you are starting to speak about the problematization, the problem you are tackling. So, however, recent review, recent review works on the role of affect states have focused on other management subfields, such as entrepreneurial cognition, and so on. So I started saying that there were review articles on affective states, on the role of affective states, but they were about entrepreneurial cognition and, or entrepreneurial decisions. And those are different from management decisions. So I problematize the importance of investigating uh, this connection according to a managerial uh, point of view. Also identifying that uh, a pure review that was published in, in uh, 2013 uh, learner, live the soul and custom uh, was a psychological oriented review published in, in the annual review of psychology. So it did not consider the uh, organizational level in which uh, uh, members 
are playing uh, in, in the business setting. And there were some uh, collective uh, exchange of emotions that were not considered at, at, their, at their individual levels in their paper. So I problematized the, uh, the, 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 the need for the review article in this second paragraph. Then the theory. The theory is the first building block that is different according to the conceptual review or empirical paper that you are building. Uh, it lasts between more or less uh, 1,200 words to 1,600 words. Uh, what is, um, let's say, similar between the among the three is the the first uh, the, the first paragraph, the first. Uh, sentences you will write that are about the relevance of the research area and the uh, seminal assumptions that are important for uh, for that research area you are tackling. Uh, for the conceptual paper, you will uh, dip those uh, assumptions, identify some similarity differences about the advancements that have been made within the theory, and again restate the, the problem uh, within the literature. Uh, it is uh, um, in, in conceptual papers, uh, it can be uh, a short uh, section because of the fact that the other sections within the paper are uh, devoted to uh, explore more and more what you have said at the conceptual level. So the goal here for the conceptual paper is to identify this seminal assumption, deepening them, identify some similarity difference and the problem. For review articles, the theoretical background is sometimes optional. There are some uh, review articles that do not, that do not show um, a theoretical uh, background before arriving at the main thoughts uh, of, the, of the review article. Uh, it is a matter of style and it is also a matter of the journal style. So each journal said before, uh, as its audience and as its style. Uh, so, uh, for example, there are, as I said before, there are review articles that have no, uh, that do not uh, provide any theoretical information. Those theoretical information are within the intro, uh, and then they are deepened within the findings and discussion of, uh, of review articles. If there is this uh, theoretical background within the review article, uh, again, the relevance of the research area, the seminal assumptions, identify the problems not tackled by the current literature. So in this case, you will not identify similarity, differences, uh, and the boundaries of the theory because they are, they are the object of what you will discuss with your review. Empirical papers. So in that case, the, um, uh, the, um, the theory that you will develop uh, within the theoretical the background is oriented to support your point of view, to support the hypothesis, if it is uh, um, an empirical quantitative contribution, to support the hypothesis that you will then test thanks to your methodology. Uh, so, uh, respect to the review and conceptual papers here, in the empirical ones, you have to clearly state your hypothesis, and it is very good to, to do uh, what is very good to do is to offer a model, a graphical model that synthesizes the hypothesis of the of the contribution. Uh, so identify a model that connect the variables uh, and uh, identify the hypothesis uh, that connect uh, them in a positive, negative way. Also showing the moderators, mediators within those uh, relationships uh, that that govern those relationships. Um, and for uh, qualitative articles, hypothesis uh, can be substituted by uh, open research questions or propositions. Propositions are a way uh, by which uh, the theoretical, uh, empirical qualitative articles are built around. So instead of hypothesis, you have some theoretical propositions. That is an example for uh, a, theoretical, a theoretical background of a review article. This is the full theoretical background for the review article mm -hmm. I shown you before. As you can see, it is no more than uh, 300, uh, 400 words, more or less. So it gives uh, a snapshot 
uh, of what is the theoretical uh, background be behind that review article I was speaking before. Uh, and it's not saying something more because uh, the similarity differences boundaries of the theory will be then uh, investigated in the in the body of the article. Then the method. For conceptual paper, uh, I, I can start saying that the method is not shown. Yeah, it is not shown usually. Uh, the, it, it, it does not mean that conceptual papers have not theory, they have a theory, uh, but uh, there is no uh, formal section about uh, theory. Uh, you can see, uh, for example, that uh, uh, a methodological uh, a, a method that is usually for building conceptual papers, it is a multi-paradigm or a meta-paradigm. Uh, those are examples of how a theoretical contribution is, uh, uh, is built on, uh, a conceptual contribution is built on. But there is no, no uh, formal methodological uh, section. Uh, for review and empirical papers, uh, they last between 500 and no, 500, uh, 900 words, more or less. It can be more. Uh, it depends uh, on the, the, let's say, the, com the, the complexity of the yeah. of the review article, your methodology, and uh, the empirical article and its methodology. So it is uh, this length can be can be greater. New article. Uh, it is important again to state the need for a review and highlighting the maturity of the field. Indeed, as said before, review articles are needed only when uh, the, the field is at a mature stage. So first of all, state again why, according to you, the field is at a mature stage. You can recur to uh, Edmondson and McManus in 2007, the article I was speaking before. Then explain the data collection procedures that are the basis you used, the strings of research for searching <laughs> the articles in those databases, and inclusion exclusion criteria for your article. Indeed, there are some articles that have been included and some others no. And explain how did you uh, analyze literature? Usually, it can be a thematic analysis, a content uh, analysis, adopting the Joya, uh, the Dennis Joya method, uh, or others. So you have to explain after having collected the, the literature, thanks to your inclusion exclusion, exclusion criteria. What do you do with this literature? So it is important to state, okay, after having collected 100 papers, how you analyze those 100 papers? What is the lens you adopt for uh, uh, reading those 100 papers, for example? So you have to clearly explain how the, uh, the lens you are adopting is put in practice. Then empirical papers. Uh, in this case, about the method, you have uh, again to state why uh, it is needed a qualitative or quantitative analysis to explain your sample, the collected variables, uh, how, do, how you measure those variables, uh, provide a, a snapshot of the sample, so who are, who are your respondents. Then again, also in this case, uh, identify the data analysis you adopted. Uh, if it is qualitative, thematic analysis, uh, again, for, uh, for reading, uh, for, for analyzing interviews from a panel, or uh, some um, methodological, uh, <coughs> some, uh, some empirical quantitative uh, data analysis uh, methods, such as the analysis of, varium, va uh, the analysis of variance, uh, regressions, and so on. This is an example of uh, uh, the, 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 the example of a, a MIFO section, but of course not the full MIFO section, but just uh, a part of it. This is uh, um, the example of a paper I'm working on. It is uh, about the role of shared leadership on uh, decision quality, and I started uh, saying what is uh, my sample, the variables uh, I collected. Uh, uh, how I did collect this sample in the variables and so on. Findings. For conceptual papers, findings are the theoretical development you propose, so the theory you propose. And it can cross 
over different subsection. So this is the theoretical proposition that you have for your paper. For both, uh, for, sorry, for all the three concept or review empirical papers, they last between 1,500 words to 2,000, more or less. Um, and for, bo for both conceptual and uh, review articles, uh, at the beginning of your findings, uh, you can have uh, uh, an organizing framework that depicts from the very beginning what is your conceptual proposition. Indeed, nowadays, review articles are more and more inclined to be uh, considered as the first stage for uh, drive theory for, uh, for the future. So with review articles, you do not just synthesize literature, but you also make some proposition for the future. So what is in the common practice right now is to start your findings with the uh, conceptual proposition, the organizing framework, the conceptual model that comes out from the literature you have analyzed and that mm -hmm. then will be used to uh, identify uh, similarities and differences uh, within the field uh, the, uh, according to your uh, literature analysis, the boundaries of the literature, uh, new uh, conceptualization of the literature and so on. For empirical papers, in, uh, um, instead, uh, you have to build those, find, those sections about the findings according to the propositions or hypotheses you have tested. So think about the correspondence, one proposition or one hypothesis, one uh, subsection of the finding. So each subsection of the findings should explode the uh, proposition or hypothesis you have tested, uh, identify if this proposition or uh, hypothesis has been uh, verified, um, and report the quotes for empirical qualitative articles or reports the stats for empirical quantitative articles that support why that hypothesis can be considered supported or not supported. And this is an example for uh, findings for a quali empirical qualitative quantitative paper in which we state that we adopt the path analysis to test the moderated mediation model and then uh, we say that hypothesis one suggests the mediating role of decision comprehensiveness between shared leadership and decision quality. And we said that these results uh, support what we have uh, found providing the stats, what we have hypothesized be providing the stats. Discussion, uh, let's say the same amount more or less of results uh, of findings. concept uh, on the conceptualization the novel conceptualization you propose and what is a good practice to do here for a conceptual paper is not only to provide the theory um, that uh, is a uh, novel and it is built according to your conceptualization but also to provide a practical example that follows the model so trying to inform the reader about the practical relevance of your model uh, alternating uh, a, a, a theoretical explanation with a practical one. For review articles, in this case, within the, the discussion uh, section, you, uh, as I said before, propose the, difference, the differences, similarities, and boundaries of the literature, new conceptualization, and you, in this case, detail the model uh, that I suggested building at the beginning. So the model that is uh, that comes out from the review article, uh, from the analysis of the literature, and that can drive the next um, the, the next development uh, of the literature and how to read the uh, literature that has been built uh, till now and the literature that will be built in the future. Uh, for empirical articles, the, those are different because each result that has been verified or not is then discussed. So you will come back to the theory that you have at the beginning of your paper and discuss uh, why this hypothesis has been uh, verified or not verified according to the prior literature. So trying to find the explanation of why this uh, literature has been uh, uh, is it, why this phenomenon happens and if the literature supports or not supports that phenomenon, why? You have to find the explanation, not just to say 
uh, this is confirmed or not confirmed, but provide the reader with the, the, with the theoretical and practical explanation of why it happens as, as it did. Uh, this is an example of discussion in which for a, an empirical paper in which you can find that after having uh, stated uh, the positive influence of a shared leadership and decision quality, then it is proposed that why this, uh, this happens. Um, so uh, other literature is used in order to uh, identify uh, why it happens and uh, provide explanations. Finally, conclusions. This is pretty similar among the uh, three types of uh, papers that we have uh, identified. Uh, state the aim of the paper and main findings. So what was the research question, the aim of the paper? What were the main findings? Maybe also the methodology. How do you advance prior literature or complete it? So uh, readers want to know how you uh, progress with the literature. So what is the way forward for the literature? How you completed the, uh, the prior one? It's what, what's new uh, respect to prior literature? Then a light practical benefits for, uh, for the readers, uh, for the practitioners, for policymakers, managers, and so on. And finally, underline the limits of your work. Indeed, each work, uh, even the best one, publishing the best journals has limits. So you have to clearly point out those uh, limits. And these are important also because can be a backdoor for your paper when uh, reviewers are very tough to you in terms of uh, uh, comments. There are some comments that you cannot solve within the review process because uh, they will require re redo, uh, redoing all the research activities, but you do not want or you cannot. Uh, and you can use these limits, limitation parts in order to uh, stress the limits pointed out by, by the reviewers. And then set the future research for, for the field. So identify what other researchers can do with the, after your paper. So there can be also a research agenda for yourself. So identifying what you can do as a scholar uh, if you want to dip again and again uh, the relationships that uh, you have studied before. So it can be a personal research agenda that you can share with, with the others. Here are some elements of silence. Then there is the uh, Luna's part with the um, IT use of uh, the IT, I, uh, AI tools for uh, social science research. Uh, these are very, very, very brief elements of science. The first one, uh, for each subsection, usually uh, they should be accompanied with eight paragraphs. No more because otherwise the paper it is too short. No, uh, sorry, no less uh, and no more because then the paper can be uh, too long and the reader will be bored uh, due to your, uh, to your paper. So eight paragraphs maximum mm -hmm. for each section. Then for each paragraph, uh, between 12 and 22 lines, uh, as I said before, no less because otherwise the paper is too fragment, fragmented and the audience uh, will uh, lose the thread of your reasoning. Uh, no more because otherwise the reader will uh, feel lost in a very long paragraph. For each paragraph, the uh, structure is the following. State the point, for example, uh, the theoretical assumptions that uh, are the basis of your paper, then deepen the point, and finally provide an example. Uh, another tip is put always statements in a positive form, uh, trying to have a, a positive and direct link with the, with the readers. So uh, say no, not using a passive form that can let appear the paper as not uh, personal and uh, uh, at the same time not strong. A positive form is the one that let appears the paper as a, a strong one, as having implications, trying to provide something new. This is the 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 why of the active tone and the positive form. And you think is enough for me? Thank you. And then Luna. Thanks, Matteo. So. Um... As you have uh, been able to see uh, with Matteo, um, is not writing is not just about creativity. It's not enough to have an idea. It's not enough even to uh, identify, for example, a research gap. 
is something that, uh, according to uh, the slide that you saw with Matteo, is something that we can like, um, and we have to um, structurize in some way. So uh, we need to use uh, a certain amount of word for each section. Uh, we need to use a certain type of style, et cetera, et cetera. So it means that in some way, uh, we can um, wrote and we can write our paper also uh, by um, the use of uh, some tips, some um, tools even. And that's why with um, Mateus, we decided to provide to you also some elements in order uh, to inform you about the use of AI tools, especially now, because as Matteo said uh, before, we are living uh, in a society in which this type of tools are uh, more and more uh, important, are more and more part of our life, even personal life. So, um, we cannot uh, exclude this type of tool even in the uh, academic research. So uh, I have just provided you some uh, examples of the uh, many, many tools, AI tools that you can find in order to uh, help you not just writing um, your paper mm -hmm. or uh, your essay, your uh, master thesis, your PhD thesis and so on. But um, what makes this tool interesting is that um, they also help you to come up with new ideas. So you can ask to uh, this tool, so you can ask to the uh, AI to provide you tips, to provide you uh, ideas, we could say uh, suggestions, in order to better uh, develop maybe the basic idea that you had. But you can also use these tools in order to make videos and images. Why videos and images are uh, more and more important in the uh, academic research? Because uh, you need to be captive. Uh, and sometimes um, writing a paper or writing a research proposal, especially when your uh, audience is made up by a practitioner, uh, it means that most of the time you are going to lose their interest. So if you can uh, transform your uh, proposal into uh, a video or uh, a very interesting image, maybe it's going to be easier uh, for you to catch the attention. Uh, so these tools are um, also, <clears throat> sorry, are also uh, widely used in terms of uh, general uh, education. So not just uh, academic research and writing, but even if you, um, I don't know if uh, as PhD students, for example, you have uh, like classes or you have special lecture that you can uh, provide, for example, to bachelor students or something like that. But if you need to prepare a lesson, it's going to be easier to catch the attention if you have this type of image and videos. So uh, on the web, you can find very thousand and thousand AI tools uh, that can help you, uh, that can provide you with this type of, um, uh, this type of deals. Um, moreover, uh, one step that is uh, actually uh, ongoing in the academic research and that is that uh, when you, for example, uh, when you do a submission to, to journal in Elsevier, um, Science Direct or wherever, they will ask you if you have, for example, visual abstract. So not just the abstract, uh, the uh, traditional one, the classical one that you saw with uh, Matteo, but uh, even if you have a visual one, so 
are you able to provide a visualization of your paper? So starting from the research question to the results obtained. Are you able to transform your paper in an interesting image? Are you able to provide, for example, a very short video through which you are able to present your paper, your research, your results? Uh, this is like the evolution of the highlights that sometimes uh, journals ask you to provide together with your, uh, with your manuscript. So uh, here I just put some example, like for example, paper poll, easy diffusion, write rule, and, and so on. And I think that uh, one of the most used uh, tools, AI tools in this vein is for sure uh, chat GPT. Uh, I think that uh, all of us have used it at least just to try just to uh, make um, a guess on what is able this tool to provide. How can I use it? Let's just ask a question to, uh, to chat uh, GPT and let's see which kind of uh, answer it, uh, it is going to provide. What is interesting is that right now, these tools are not just tools anymore, we could say. And here I have just provided to you two examples of chat, GPT, use it, insert it, put it in a, a paper as co-author. So it's not just uh, something that relates to, um, to a sphere of tools, of instruments, of something that you can use in order to support your research. But if you use and if you consider, uh, if you consider, because use is different, use, uh, if you use chat GPT, it means that for you is a tool, is a support. But if you consider chat GPT as your co-author, it means that your perception is completely different. So you are not using it as a tool, you are not using it as a, uh, in order to support your research, your writing, your ideas generation, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, you consider it as your peer. And in this vein, uh, for example, Emerald Publishing just state that uh, they do not uh, accept chat GPT as a co-author, so cannot be credited with authorship. And at the same time, uh, you have to um, recognize, you have to acknowledge if you used in some way chat GPT in order to create, I don't know, a paragraph, in order to create uh, a chapter, in order to write a study, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to acknowledge it, but you cannot um, identify it as a, a co-author. So I was like uh, thinking about this uh, evolution of the academic writing. And obviously, there is a, a lot of food for thought in this vein. So we can reasoning a lot about what are the uh, even the ethical aspect related to this type of tools. And um, I want to just give you some, um, how can I say, suggestions, uh, some food for thought in order to start a, a personal reflection that I think all of us uh, is come to, uh, is actually, it's time to, to do this type of reflection. So there are for sure some way through which we have to, uh, we can actually use this type of tools. So I'm not, um, I do not think that we should uh, avoid using this type of tools. They are important. They, uh, we could say, are becoming even uh, essential 
in the academic research, in the uh, academic world, so in the education in general. So the difference is that we need to understand how it is possible to use these tools in the um, most efficient way. How we can really try to uh, combine these tools with um, the human aspect that is actually uh, essential uh, in the in research. So uh, the balance between human and machine, how do you have to collaborate? And this, in this vein, I have tried to identify uh, four main tips uh, in order to use this type of tools. So the first one is to add restriction in order to minimize errors. The second tips uh, refer to um, the comparison. So you have to compare the results that the AI tools is providing to you with, the, with your knowledge, first of all. So what you know about that specific, uh, the specific topic and then use also different sources. And lastly, co-editing. So work together, trying to find your balance with the specific uh, topic that you are addressing. And you can also find in the, in the slide on the screen an example. So it is completely different if you ask, for example, to uh, ChatGPT, if you ask to generate a five paragraph essay on selecting leaders. So this is a type of question. This is a type of um, query that you can provide to, um, to the AI tools. It is completely different if you ask the same, but if you set some kind of restriction, some time of limit. So for example, generate a five paragraph essay on how team select leaders, team processes and leadership abilities uh, in 250 words. So now you are adding restriction. In this way, it's going to be easier for you to understand also what the AI tools is providing to you in terms of answer. And it's even uh, more different if you uh, ask to the tools to write for a professor in an MBA class. So to use a certain type of language, a certain type of style. And uh, once again, it is different if you ask to provide not just the five paragraph, but even example, to use active tense, to use storytelling techniques, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the last, um, in the last steps is like you need to find your balance you need to to co-editing with the machine so it means that you ask tools to change for example some paragraph to do not use some type of examples etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh once you obtain the results of the AI tools, obviously we said that you have to compare these results with your knowledge on that specific topic or topics. But AI tools is, uh, you have to uh, understand these tools as a, any kind of other tools that you currently already used in order to write a paper. So it's just a source of uh, information, but the responsibility related to those information, it's up to you. It's not the AI tools that can take the responsibility. So if you are writing a paper, if you are writing a thesis or uh, an essay, wherever, thanks to these tools, you are responsible for the information you are providing. So that's why you always need to verify if the information that AI tools is, uh, has generated are true or not. How? You have 
to um, compare these results with other sources. So you need to uh, look for other uh, published articles, you need uh, to search in books, uh, in other, for example, databases, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, uh, we could say, a more ethical way in which we can use these tools. And, um, According to this, I have also tried to identify which are the best uh, pros and cons uh, related to uh, AI tools in academic writing. So, as I said before, um, I strongly believe, I firmly believe that we have to use this type of tools. That these tools need to be a part of our work of our research work, of our publication, or our um, um, even uh, teaching staff, education, and so on. But we need to identify uh, the best way in which we can use these tools. So uh, why we have to use them? We have to use them because uh, due to their efficiency and scalability. So for sure, using AI tools we uh, allow us to save both a lot of time and even money because it's easier for us, for example, even to correct uh, the language that we are going to use in the paper, et cetera, et cetera. So we do not have to pay a proofreader uh, in order to make this type of work. Uh, we have to use uh, AI tools in order to um, generate ideas. I do not think that uh, AI tools may provide new ideas. I think that this type of tools could like help us overcoming the writer's block. So it means that sometimes we just feel alone on the white page and we said, okay, I really do not feel to have the right idea. I do not feel that um, maybe I'm even developing this idea in a proper way. So it is like we have uh, um, a 24 hour, seven um, and seven days uh, always available friend to which we could ask about what do you think on this idea? Do you think it's good? How do you think I could further develop it? Uh, any kind of suggestion and so on. So in this way, it is like if you have a colleagues always uh, near to you in order to discuss about your uh, even potential idea for paper, for thesis or wherever. Moreover, thanks to the... Um, AI tools, we are able to use a uh, location specific language. So it means that, for example, we can correct our uh, language according to, for example, UK style or Americans one, but even uh, the possibility to grammatically correct our sentences. So this is very helpful for us as researchers, but even for uh, for students in order to provide something that uh, properly makes sense. And uh, obviously, uh, most of these tools uh, will get smarter with time. So it means that if we are using uh, day by day, we are going to obtain best results, I don't know, in one week, one month, one year, et cetera, et cetera. So they have the capability to learn and according also to modify their answer and their, um, their suggestions to, to us. At the same time, there is the other phase of the coin. So first of all, it always requires human involvement, at least for the um, AI right now and this type of tools right now, we need uh, to be involved in the process. Otherwise, we are not going to obtain any kind of results. Uh, then we have to consider that all the uh, answer provided by uh, this type of tools likes the human personality. 
So it means that uh, sometimes they are not able to properly involve, to even encourage. Let's think, for example, to uh, a lesson provided by an AI instead of a teacher, a human professor. Can you imagine how much different he is in terms of involvement, in terms of interaction, in terms of even feeling with our people within the class? Then we do not have to uh, forget that uh, there are many kind of biases and uh, so we need to consider that this type of tools uh, can make errors, can include biases. And uh, to be ethical, to be fair, we should try to avoid this type of, um, of behavior. Then there are uh, so many quality concerns related to AI tools. So let's think about plagiarism, the fact uh, we were discussing about this topic before, so the, the fact that they do not take the responsibility of the information provided. And sometimes those information are even uh, outdated or incorrect. And then uh, this type of tool can like induce to the laziness so we feel that, oh, yeah, it's going to be so much easier for me to write this paper. It's going to be much easier for me to write the master thesis or the PhD thesis just because I have the AI tools that can do the work for me. So I will just ask to the tools to provide to me, I don't know, uh, an entire chapter devoted to uh, the most recent theories on knowledge management and then to provide me examples related to the best companies that implement this kind of practices, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is obviously easy for us as humans to uh, be induced in this type of behaviors. But uh, once you are able to recognize that your role as students, your role as researchers, as teachers, is something more, is not just to uh, have the paper done or to make the essay or to prepare the thesis, is to increase your knowledge is to provide your knowledge to an audience, to someone else, to your students, to your peers, etc. So in that moment, in that specific time, you are able to recognize that these tools are useful, but just as tools. So they cannot uh, substitute human. They can just support us uh, by um, helping the researchers, the students, the professor work to save, as we said before, time and money, but not, uh, we do not have to lost our patient and the AI tools cannot provide us with this type of feeling, cannot uh, push us in this type of um, behavior and uh, and feeling. So uh, saying that now the last part of this uh, of this lecture is devoted uh, to um, to the last step of the research um, of the of publishing research. So we saw at the beginning how to write uh, a paper. We saw also how to write the paper uh, thanks to the adoption of some, some uh, AI tools. But then uh, we used to have, uh, if the paper is not going to be rejected, <laughs> we, use, uh, we are going to have uh, reviewers' comments. So uh, in the next few slides, we uh, are trying to hypothesize a way through which it is possible <clears> to <throat> manage even these, um, 
this process stage of the publication procedure. And um, what we think is important to understand is that even this part is crucial in order to see your article published. So you do not have to, uh, do not consider uh, the reviewer's comments or to say, oh, okay, maybe uh, I can just answer in a very superficial way. It is very important that you take seriously this type of comments and also that you take seriously the procedure before answering these comments. So in these slides, uh, you can see um, a very uh, brief uh, guide uh, with the five main steps on how to um, to answer to the reviewer's comments. So we uh, think that due to our experience, uh, the first step is to uh, categorize. It means that you need to identify, because sometimes you receive more than just two uh, reviewers' comments. It could be like three reviewers, four reviewers, even five. Yeah. <laughs> we know very well, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, so you need to categorize. So you need to, uh, it is like the thematic analysis that you can yeah. use uh, in the in the methodology section so you need to identify comments um categories so <laughs> which are for example aspect that all the reviewers identify as an issues as a weaknesses of your paper and you have to categorize the reviewers comments accordingly after that you have to uh, align so you need to uh, be sure that these comments go in the same direction. If, and if there is this alignment, there yeah, alignment between the reviewers' comments, you need to identify a specific strategy and a balance between these comments in order to identify which is the best option for you and which is the best answer that you have to provide. Uh, then the third step is to prioritize. That means you need to understand which are the comments through which you have to answer before because they are going to change all the other aspects of the paper. So you need to answer before to this type of comments and then to the easiest yeah. and sometimes usually, even smaller ones. Usually those comments uh, that are uh, the highest priority as uh, mythological comments or, to, or <clears throat> theoretical comments or something that reviewers commented, commented on your theory and if something does not work on your theory then it affects your methods, your results, implications and so on. Uh, and methods. If there is something wrong in the methods, how you collect data or how you analyze data, you have maybe to re-identify what are your results, finding implications, and uh, reshape a bit also the, the introduction uh, accordingly. And in the prioritization and alignment of comments, it is important also to like that sometimes it can happen that <clears throat> Uh, one reviewers commit the stronger than the others on your paper. So answering that the comments of that reviewers uh, will be helpful for you to answer the comments of other reviewers. So in this pro process of alignment and prioritizing, uh, you can also identify if there are uh, there is a reviewer that, that uh, has uh, let's say more power in uh, shaping the direction of your uh, contribution and. Uh, uh, if uh, satisfying him or her will uh, uh, help you to satisfy the others. Yeah, and after that, the fourth phase uh, will be, if you are not the <laughs> uh, only author of the publication, to uh, split. So to uh, identify according to uh, the number of the uh, authors in the, in the publication, who is responsible for um, each specific category of, um, that you have identified. So you need to be sure that, for example, if there is one of your authors 
Rivers, that is the expert one in terms of the methodology, is going to be the responsible one in order to provide the, uh, the answer and even to correct your paper according to the reviewer's comments for those aspects related to the methodology. The same for the theoretical parts, results, discussion, and, and so on. It, and, it can yeah. happen that in this splitting, there are some comments, as I said before, that are more important than others. So, uh, and if there are about methods or theory, you cannot work sometimes in parallel. So there is someone that takes the leads of, uh, of comment uh, of comments, so we'll answer to the uh, most important uh, comment about the theory of methodology, and then you have to work in a subsequent manner. There are other times in which uh, comments on various parts does not affect each other so much, uh, so one, uh, one author should not wait for the others having a completion the task so they can work in parallel. At the same time, in the Splitting phase, you have also to consider the role of each author in that publication. I mean that if you are, I don't know, uh, four authors, maybe the last one is also the less responsible one for the uh, for the publication. So the ones that put less effort on that. So maybe you will just provide a reviewed version of the manuscript to this author in order to finalize the uh, reading and writing part and, and so on. And then obviously the last part refers to integration. It means that even if you uh, can work in parallel or not, at the end, all the authors have to reread and be sure that the different answer and as well the different section of the revised manuscript are integrated to each other so that there are no uh, conflicts, even in terms of um, reading. Uh, so it should be also fluid in terms of uh, of reading the new uh, version of your of your manuscript. Yeah, in this phase, who can help you is for sure uh, a proofreader. A proofreader that is who will uh, correct your uh, proofs according to a communication style and uh, also English <coughs> point of view, because manuscripts nowadays in science are written mainly in English. And uh, don't think that um, proofreading is something just that should be done by non-native speakers, non-native English speakers, because I, uh, I work with uh, several uh, scholars also, uh, Anglo-Saxon ones, so from UK or from US or other, other Anglo-Saxon countries, and they themselves use proofreaders, though uh, I just remember the last uh, paper accepted in uh, Academy of Management Perspectives with uh, uh, a native speaker a scholar uh, from uh, Australia. We had a very, very expensive proofreader that helped us a lot with the communication style and Eng English style of, uh, of the paper. So proofreading is not just uh, something for uh, non-native speakers. And it's something related really to the uh, way through which your paper is able to communicate. Mm -hmm. So it is like a marketing yeah. <laughs> strategy of your of your paper. Then here we have just a, a, a topology, a, an answer example of a reviewer comment uh, on a one uh, on um, a, a paper that uh, I, I replied as uh, for minor revisions I received. We have a comment about the theoretical uh, backdrop, background of, uh, of the paper, asking me to, uh, asking us uh, to uh, build more on uh, the management theory behind the paper and the connection with practice. So in these comments, we first thank you, the, the reviewer, for, for that comment. And then we uh, saying that we agreed with, uh, with him or her, and then said how we operated to answer this, um, this comment. What is important here when answering is not just saying, okay, we met your, uh, your comments, we satisfied the comments. No, th this is not the correct strategy. The correct strategy for having an effective result, and with the effective result, I mean having the paper accepted, hopefully, is to clearly answer how you uh, operated for uh, answering that comment and for uh, 
uh, meeting the, the need of the of, of the reviewer the the the, uh, the the provocation of the reviewer in that case we explained that in order to um, identify the originality of the manuscript connection with the management theory in practice we follow a very important uh, paper published on academy of management review in 2018 uh, in, to, to identify or to make the introduction more effective and we explain what were the points we uh, stressed during uh, during the introduction and uh, sometimes you can even provide um the specific part of the revised uh version of your manuscript that answer and that uh, accomplish the needs um expressed by the the reviewers so the reviewers doesn't need to uh reread maybe the entire manuscript but because you already provide in the answer the specific part of the of the paper according to to his or her comment. Yeah, and the more those reviewers' answers are made great, uh, the less will be the probabilities that the the reviewer will look for the full version of the paper. Sometimes he or she will just look at your answers and make the the suggestions related to 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 your question to, to to your comments and the answers if they were satisfied uh, or not so this is why it is important for uh, answering effectively to 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 reviewers sometimes there is also the occasion in which he, the authors do not agree with the reviewers comments or there is a reviewer uh, that provides a direction that is in contrast with the ones said uh, pointed out by other reviewers in this last case you can just uh, support your way of operational of, of operating for the manuscript saying that you preferred to follow the uh, the directions of other reviewers that are more aligned with the aim and scope of your paper with what you had in your mind uh, so answering to him or her thanks to the comments of other reviewers that point out uh, another direction or uh, if it is a one-to-one -one relationship a, a comment that has been erased by just one reviewer and you don't agree with them uh, with that comment you have just to to say thanks uh, and explain why you do not agree with that comments not just saying no but saying according to a theoretical point of view or methodological point of view why you think that the uh, the reviewer is not right and why you want to continue pursuing your directions also providing references strong references in theoretical and methodological manner and in theoretical as aspects that uh, help you in answering those uh, those reviewers comments and saying no i prefer following my my direction so it is possible to say no <laughs> to reviewers <laughs> Uh, but be sure that it is not just some uh, kind of biases in your mind that um, uh, if you are going in contrast with, uh, with the reviewers, but it is something strongly supported by uh, some kind of evidence. So it means other papers, book or wherever that maybe took your same, uh, the same point of view of your uh, publication. So now I think that we have concluded the, the content part of our lecture and now we uh, present you some very few publication opportunities and give you the, the time uh, for once for uh, questions and answers. <laughs> so we'll be very fast on, uh, on this part about the publication uh, opportunity we have uh, in somehow under our control in the sense that we lead these publication opportunities. Yeah, basically, as uh, Matteo said before, I'm the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Information and Operation Management Education. So uh, this journal is mainly devoted to uh, continuing education and lifetime learning in the field of information and operation management mainly. But we are uh, basically interested in publishing research that advance uh, studies on um, on education. So if you are interested, please um, send your contribution to us. And at the same time, <coughs> sorry, 
Mm -hmm. I'm part of the uh, RISA community, so the European Association for Research on Surfaces. And uh, each year uh, we organize uh, a conference. So um, this year is going to be in Finland, but next year uh, we will host this uh, conference in Rome. And what it what can be interesting, um, apart from uh, the fact that uh, any kind of conference will provide you, uh, can provide you uh, network opportunities, uh, a lot of suggestions by uh, different type of uh, scholars at different levels and, and so on. Um, what I want to stress here is the fact that research um, as a specific grant, actually, we have two grants. One is for um, PhD, is a PhD award for uh, those PhD students that send their work uh, to the, the conference. So the, the work is evaluated uh, by a specific committee and you can win like um, uh, a prize and a, uh, and a related award, but we have also another kind of uh, award that is related to uh, facilitate mobility. So if you want to, for example, spend a period in one of the uh, university of one of the member of the research community, you can apply also for this uh, visiting uh, award. Okay, and then there is the journal I direct, I'm editor in chief. It is International Journal of Business Search and Management. It is an open access one. It means that there is a very small fee, a very small fee of $150 to publish, but waivers, full waivers uh, can, uh, are possible for uh, interested authors, so I can uh, provide the full discounts. Uh, the demoscope of this journal is uh, very general in the management and the in, in the management business domain. Uh, so whatever kind of topic that has a link with the business uh, uh, management uh, field is uh, is uh, is welcome, and uh, we are always looking as for uh, Ijome, the the journal directed by Luna. We look for uh, uh, good works. And uh, especially from young scholars that want to uh, receive uh, initial feedbacks to their works and uh, publish them in a in a good outlet, but at the same time receiving a very good feedback for uh, for improving them. Then other publication opportunities that are more related to me. Uh, I have two special issues that I'm leading. The first uh, one in terms of deadline in the is the special issue about strategic management in the new normal uh, for corporate governance and research and development studies with deadline April 24 that can be extended for another 10-15 10, 15 days if uh, interested. And it is uh, more about uh, looking at how management and the governance uh, changed after the COVID-19. So what are the uh, new directions that the strategic management and governance are taking for uh, for this new normal era that we are <coughs> learning? What has changed? What are the new practices, the new practices uh, that are put in, in practice? as to develop theories. Uh, and then another special issue for managing decision, in which I am also associated for managing decision from uh, October 2022. Uh, the special issue is about environmental social governance assets, and the deadline is October uh, the 30th, so there is uh, plenty of time. Uh, here we are interested on papers dealing with the so-called the ESG uh, matter, ESG field, that is uh, an ascent and uh, fast growing one uh, papers dealing with the the, the, the sustainability in a, in a larger sense because interested also uh, not only in a sustainability in terms of uh, in, environmental sustainability but also social and governance sustainability thanks to this new framework of ESG uh, also in this in this case we are interested not only in a paper supporting this uh, new view of uh, sustainability, let's say, this update of sustainability, but also to uh, see if there are uh, shadows in, uh, in this new field that is uh, growing and growing. 
Then there is uh, uh, the uh, conference that uh, I'm leading, Business Search Emergent Conference, linked to the journal I'm leading. And uh, that then is April the 1st, uh, so in a week. Um, and it, it will be in Tirana, but it is in hybrid form. So uh, papers, extended abstracts, you no know, papers, extended abstracts that will be submitted uh, will, can be presented uh, online. Thank and, you. And then thank you. And uh, we are open questions, answers, and uh, and others. Um, oh, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luna and Matteo. I think it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for sharing all the your experience, your knowledge, and also these international opportunities for, for the students. I think this was a presentation with so much value for the PhD and, and master students, and hope in the future you can viabilize not a digital, but a presential uh, mm -hmm. presence yeah, of people yeah. here in our, our campus. Um, I think we'll open now for the, the some questions for the audience. In the meanwhile, I will just make a summarization. So uh, Professor Matteo talked about the perspectives on idea generation connecting to the reality, seeing the ideas from industry, understanding location in order to, to evoke big whys, the difference between conceptual review and article and different methods and strategies we need to address concerning these types. The building blocks for providing uh, for publishing an article, and I think it was very important, Matteo, for providing the specifics, best practice, and parameters to structure better and organize the communication. That thing that you mentioned in the end about using more active voice from passive voice, especially when we publish in uh, mm -hmm. English and Anglo section. But I think in the end we are talking about the language of scientific writing. I think this is the the, the big question behind. We are now trying to communicate with the big language of scientific writing. And Luna presented about how AI tools in the several stages for the research workflows, the benefits, the problematization, and how can we now adopt and understand human machine interpretation, sense making, responsibility. And we need to be aware that our pros or cons. Maybe we can see that now AI can augment capabilities for research, has internet did in the 90s, and this mm -hmm. changes everything. But we need to address that in a, a responsible way because we are dealing essentially with language creation. And it was very good the method you presented about the steps or how can we organize our, our feedback process and reviewers with the reviewers, sorry. Uh, I'd like just to make the first question, then I we are organized the, the questions that are appearing here. Uh, Luna and Matteo, I, I had uh, read an article about the historian Yuval Ahari. Uh, this week, and he and he claimed that the main impact of the AI now and in, in, in the future could be like over language control, because what is happening when you have the language control happening over AI, language can create culture. Mm -hmm. So this is like the big change that can happen in the next few years. If you have a control over a new language, you can shape a new culture. If we think now and translate that into the scientific community, the language that you have in the scientific community, the culture we have in the scientific community, this new generation of AI, maybe it's a matter in your point of view of disruption, or maybe it could be a point or co-evolution, or where the scientific community will learn how to better work with AI and creating, we don't know what yet, but <laughs> a new... Scenario. I think that uh, even due to our uh, background, we both could say and that we hope that the uh, results of this is going to be the uh, co-evolution mm -hmm. between uh, researchers and AI tools. Obviously, as I said before, um, and as you summarized, there are uh, so many uh, pros and cons, and we need, uh, as all the new um as all the, the innovation actually we add so it is like the mobile phone uh the use of laptop or even uh the different type of application uh whatsapp or wherever uh, everything depends on how uh, are you going to use it so in terms of um 
the culture that is uh, behind the uh, scientific community. Uh, personally, I strongly uh, hope that something is going to change because we could say uh, that, and we could show that uh, there are some uh, problems, even in, I mean, as the culture of each country uh, or even the um, personal culture of each person is going to evolve according to the, the community and the society, the same as to happen also in the, in the scientific community. So we need, I think that we need time in order to find the right balance. But for sure, something is going to change also thanks to this, these tools. Yeah, no, I generally agree. What I want to add is mm, to accept, to, 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 to be open to this tool, but at the same time to be skeptical in the sense that do not rely 100% on these tools because I have my, I had my personal experience in which I asked the chat GPT to provide me uh, answers, not, not, uh, not research related, but life related. And uh, he, it provides, it provides me with the wrong answers. And I question it about the sources of these answers. I ask it to it to the chat GPT, please provide me the sources of these answers. He provided me the sources. I investigated the sources, and those sources did not speak about the problem at hand. They speak about other other problems, they speak about another matter. So it provided me a wrong answer and provided me wrong sources. So be uh, a bit skeptical about the, the use of these IT tools in order to, uh, to, 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 to be provocative, in order to uh, have a stronger thinking, a strong reason. This is the evolution, no? Uh, be provocative in order to say if the system works or what are the boundaries till the system works. Basically, I think that we should say continue being a researcher. <laughs> so it means that you need to uh, verify the different uh, sources, answer and every information that you get before you uh, wrote anything or you will speak in, uh, I don't know, in a class or, or wherever. So that's our yeah. <laughs> advice. That's perfect. Thank you, Luna and Matteo. Uh, I'd just like to ask to the audience if someone would like to, to uh, raise a question, because I know we're now ahead of time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry for yeah. that. No, no, but, but not a problem. Otherwise, you can maybe, uh, to the audience, you can send uh, the, your questions to ppj, I hope you see us, yeah. .pr, and you can organize that and send them to, to Luna and Marcos. Yes. Why not? Okay. Thank you. Great. Great. And... Uh, before we, we uh, finish the, the presentation, Professor Alex just uh, asked me to provide uh, an information for all the students and invite everyone that will have the uh, presentation of Professor Dirk Franco from the University of Hassel, Belgium, about sustainable development goals in higher education. This will be a presential uh, presentation from Professor Dirk, uh, Friday morning, 10 p.m. So you can find more information also in the PPJ website. So uh, Luna and Mateo, thank you. Thank you so much. I think it was a, a very... It's been thank really you. a pleasure. And as you said, we yeah. hope to have uh, a class in presence mm -hmm. in the near future. Yeah. And thank you so much for your time and your contributions. Yeah. Thank well, you. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. So you. I think we can... Uh, I know if you should have like, like the final words, but then we can like... Uh, no, no, thank you. We were very grateful to you for this occasion, opportunity to speak with your students. So again, thank you. Thank you very much for yeah. inviting us. Enjoy the day. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye. So much. Thanks.